what I'm doing is a way of beating the inequality in a sense because it's not only sailing alone but also uh, being able to afford the sailing alone and then being able to show this to the other woman just opening a door <laughs> This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. So my most professional interview is about to start. <laughs> with double cameras and the real real microphone until now I always shot myself and did my own interviews of course none of this was this special and this professional I'm so excited now Als Wassersportler ist ein guter UV-Schutz für mich natürlich wirklich essentiell deshalb haben wir unsere Zink Sonnencreme entwickelt plastikfrei riffsicher und 100% natürlich, nur von Kapitän Olsen. Okay, today I'm for an interview at Sailing Istanbul with, I'm really hard with uh, <laughs> pronouncing Turkish names, so Basak? Yes, perfect. Surprisingly yeah. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, maybe you want to introduce yourself. Uh, so my name is Boshak, Boshak Mineli, uh, and we have been kind of on a road tour with my husband now. And we are actually on Panama, San Blas Islands. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been our second year almost, and we started our journey from Turkey. We passed through the Med and then uh, the Atlantic crossing, which I think is the subject of today's interview. Uh, and then we traveled around the whole Caribbean, uh, East Caribbean Islands, North Caribbean Islands, all the way through Mexico and ended up here for the hurricane season before we passed to the Pacific. So that's a little bit special today because you're a solo sailor woman, but not really a solo sailor. Normally you travel with your husband, but you kicked him off the boat for your dream to across the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Uh, so actually Atlantic crossing is not only my, uh, the Atlantic crossing is not my first solo sail. So it wasn't like that. I was sailing and then I suddenly decided to cross the Atlantic alone. Mm -hmm. I was always solo sailing. So I was like 23, now I'm 43 when I bought my first boat. Uh, and then we had we were three girls and we had a journal 32 Sunfest and we were racing on the yacht category with that boat and apart from that I was always sailing solo uh, mostly around Istanbul because I was also working and then I had my own boat the Plateau 25 which is actually a pure racing boat but then uh, I was also traveling uh, with that on offshore as well with funny stories of course with such a small boat on big seas mm -hmm. and then before actually we left for this road tour uh, I also attempted to break the Turkish coast sailing record with the Turkish Sailing Federation so I also have a tradition uh, for competency on solo sailing from the Turkish Sailing Federation okay. So I was actually always solo sailing. Uh, of course, to be able to do that, I was always training myself with the solo uh, attempts. And I was always traveling from one place to the other solo, uh, having night sails. So I was quite experienced. This Atlantic crossing was not the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you started the journey with your husband? Yeah, or I mean, is it boyfriend? No, he's my husband. Okay. And twice actually, we got divorced once and then we got married again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's also an interesting story. And it was because of the boat, because our first boat together was a Bavaria 31. But I always had dream of uh, traveling with the boat for long distances. Mm -hmm. And then we decided that we need a bigger one, which I know we both actually now see that it was wrong. And uh, we could have done this with the Bavaria 31 also. Uh, but then we bought this one, which is a Vandestad Norman 40. 
Uh, it's a steel board and then we had a lot of problems and we couldn't agree on how to solve these problems on the board and we had so many arguments that just because of the board how to refit it uh, we divorced actually. <laughs> 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 yeah, but you found back together so. Yeah, it's shortly after, just mm -hmm. three months. Uh, and then we had this second refit on the ball because uh, there were bigger problems than we expected, especially with the hole. So we had to replace some parts on the steel hole uh, mm -hmm. and it took longer than we thought. So you refitted the boat also with um, yeah, keeping in mind that you want to sail solo. So is what is special? at your boat compared to uh, let's say your Bavaria you had that makes it easier for you to sail it solo so you said the uh, twin head sails yeah actually the only thing that makes it easy to sail solo is the Tibin Yankees Yankees are uh, like Genoa's but with a higher cut mm -hmm. so it's actually good if you just use one Yankee and then this is actually a cutter so it's not a mm -hmm. sloop this boat is a cutter boat so when you have the trinket or the flock whatever you call in each country that's called something different so you can use the Yankee with the cutter, so you have the center of gravity uh, on the boat more on the center, which makes actually the wind vane work better with a better performance. Uh, so we knew from the very beginning that I had to stick to the uh, wind vane and the whole setup uh, actually been designed so that not me, but the wind vane works with a better performance. Mm -hmm. So this boat is not easy, but with the twin sails, the advantage is that you can furl them together to reef and then unfurl them together. I think not many people do that. Most people use, I think, the, the main sail and push it out to one side and then the head sail, sail to the other side. But for me, it was also much more easy to use two head sails because I was always afraid from the main sail that the boom the accidental, accidental jibe. Yes, you don't have the risk <laughs> for the accidental jibe then. Mm. So sailing itself, that means was relatively easy for you across the Atlantic or did you have some challenges? What most people are curious about are the challenges, the mental challenges that you may have which I didn't have much actually, maybe because uh, I was really prepared for this uh, and maybe because I'm not that sentimental so I didn't uh, go too deep into these thoughts and blah blah I just enjoyed the whole day, read a lot and uh, take advantage of the time that I was able to spend just by myself and didn't take it really sentimentally uh, but uh, this, uh, the coastal thing that I have done around the Turkish coast, the sailing that I have done and the problems that I had uh, actually prepared me for the Atlantic crossing. I was really ready to lose everything on the boat. <laughs> uh, no electronics, I was okay with it. I would just follow the sun. I mean, uh, and at some point I had this obsession that the uh, force day would come off. Mm -hmm. I don't really know one because you always go running and actually it's the tension on the back stay but mm -hmm. I was somehow obsessed with the fourth stay and even on the way I was okay with the mess coming off so I was the, the things that I have done really I think prepared me so the Atlantic crossing despite all the challenges uh, like taking in water uh, was quite comfortable for me so there was not really fear that something happens that you said oh shit I'm going to die no 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 but i i don't really have this fear thing in me so it was i i had a little bit of stress especially on the first three to four weeks because those are the days that you have this confuses from uh taking off from mindelo and then the time that i took off it was a very uh low pressure system coming from azores and brought all these big waves over three meters uh, so the first few days uh, until you get used to uh, the boat, the seas, the weather and making sure that you can handle everything by yourself was a little bit stressful. But once I realized that, okay, I can handle everything by myself, everything is fine uh, and the whole system right now is working, me included as a part of the system, as an element of the system, then I was feeling very, very comfortable. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it was enjoyable. I mean, people ask me, would you do it again? Uh, and I feel like, yes, I would do it again. I would do it differently, which means that I wasn't at all traumatized. I just enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good if you're not traumatized from your trip. <laughs> yeah, and the question that people ask, uh, so of course the first question everybody asks is not, are you not scared? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, because this is actually our mechanism. We get scared of things and then we, f uh, we fight uh, with the things so that we can be successful. So it's not that point. And then the second question, the other question that people frequently ask, that how does it feel to be in the middle of the ocean? Does it feel like lonely mm -hmm. and more, even more scary? I think being in the middle of the ocean feels like a success because we have made it to the middle of the ocean, <laughs> <laughs> which means that there's a high chance of getting to the other side, yeah. which is quite easy for the Atlantic. Yeah, definitely. I think that's for most people the scariest point to be so far away from everything and no, uh, yeah, no doctor who can help you, but yeah. Yeah, of course, there are a lot of risks involved with solo sailing because yeah. apart from the sailing itself, apart from the boat failures, there are many risks that you are taking. But I think it's worth the risk because it's totally a different feeling. Once you're alone for so long time, considering all this internet and the fancy things that we have at hand mm -hmm. uh, in these days, and also trying to manage everything by yourself, just listening yourself and the whole environment in, uh, around you changes the whole perception. It's like being on drugs without drugs, actually. <laughs> so it's an amazing, amazing experience. And mm -hmm. it just worth taking all those risks, I think. Yeah, one really interesting thing for me is the sleeping pattern. How did you manage this? Because for me, it's always a pain in the ass <laughs> <laughs> sleeping at night. And how I did it is that I uh, started to get trained with intermittent sleeping, systematic. So I started uh, testing myself, going into the sleep and waking up in every half an hour. Actually, now I say it's half an hour, but everybody has their own uh, sleep cycle. So actually it's for me 18 minutes. So uh, the hard thing actually is not for generally for everyone uh, is not waking up at the first days, but falling into the sleep because it's such a stressful thing. And when I'm sailing solo, I'm not just say, saying the, telling this about the Atlantic crossing. Uh, I was sailing with a spinnaker up and doing uh, five, six knots of way, even with this heavy boat, and I had to go and sleep. But it's such a stressful thing having a spinnaker and the mainsail up at the same time and going into deep sleep. So at the first days, it's the hard thing is actually going into the sleep, which mean you need to train yourself. Mm -hmm. And you do it with meditation and uh, with breathing meditation. And then I uh, I get adapted waking it every half an hour, which I used during the Atlantic passage. So I was waking every half an hour. Maybe I show you where I was sleeping. <laughs> yeah. So this is actually a deck salon board. And this is where I slept all the passage, all through the passage. So you sleep here like this. And then, if you look up, now we have the fibers, but then you can see the twin sails from here. So I open my eyes, I look up, and I just directly see if something is wrong. If not, then I go for a second round of sleep. But if something is wrong, which generally is actually, I go out and take care of what is actually wrong. I have my own video and you can put the excerpts from the video. Mm -hmm. So it's actually on the seventh or eighth day. I, I I just put the GoPro like this and I say, oh, this is the eighth day. And I started feeling quite tired physically. You have to see me. I'm just looking so good. Fresh air, no alcohol, uh, good nutrition. And it doesn't really feel like, looks like that I'm getting tired. But after some time you start getting tired and then you start having not the problem with the falling asleep, but then waking up in every half an hour. Mm -hmm. 
maybe you can block it for an hour that's also problematic to wake up and for that i'm using a device called watch command commander uh, which gives you an alarm you can set it for 20 minutes 30 minutes 40 minutes whatever you like uh, but if you don't reset the system in every half an hour let me say then it starts uh, beeping with a very high pitch and it's almost impossible not to wake up with that mm -hmm. that's interesting i'm going to uh, make a link to your atlantic crossing video to this because i think a lot of people accept that you look like a rat after 10 days alone at sea no sleep <laughs> and storms and every day and <laughs> <laughs> to tell you something some people uh, and they comment on the uh, video they don't really believe that I have done the crossing by myself and some people comment that I need to have the lips like burned because of all the sun mm -hmm. and my skin should be blah blah and come on this is a 40 feet boat with a shower inside and a, a kitchen and you have the sun so, uh, solar creams and everything the sun creams so it's not that i crossed the atlantic with a, a kayak or something so yeah, this is yeah. a fully equipped boat and things that things really don't work that way uh, but I reached to Martinique and I had also other friends doing the crossing. I was absolutely, including Omar, the best looking person after the crossing. <laughs> and Omar lost more kilos than I did actually, because we can come to that later. He was bearing all the stress and the friends, they were also, I think a little bit, some of them were a little bit seasick, which I don't have luckily. Because if you have seasickness and alone on the boat, that's another thing. And on my last day, I didn't have wind, which I motored actually, uh, 120 miles to Martinique. I cleaned up the boat, put the other fridge on as well, put the drinks, made ice so that we can have a proper party on the boat. And everybody's kind of shocked to see the boat so clean, drinks ready. I was... Uh, and there's a confession i think at this point that i need to make <laughs> i didn't sh yeah, you can take this off maybe yeah. from the video <laughs> so i was the best looking person when i reached to martini including your man yeah how that would have been my next question uh, how was it to reach martinique after that long time so i think uh, omar was waiting for you or i tell you about the last night I, it was like an animation all the stars going off and off and off then i realized actually okay this story is over mm -hmm. and <laughs> and then the next morning it was six o'clock i was just you know waiting to get a message or a call from a man and I, you know he, he tells me that we are all awake now you can come to send in but nothing and then I heard this voice on uh, uh, radio, VHF, and it was saying, uh, Turbishon, Turbishon, uh, Istanbul, Istanbul, Turbishon. And I thought that they were kidding, because you know Turbishon is what you use actually to take off, uh, to open a wine opener. It's mm -hmm. called Turbishon. And I thought that they had the wines and the champagnes and everything ready. <laughs> <laughs> And they were making a joke on VHF and calling for me to get into Santan. No, it was actually a real boat called Turbishon. <laughs> <laughs> so the boat belonged to Mari and Alchin. Kind of went together and I was posing on the boat and she was taking my photo. So we ran into Santan together. And then it was 10 dinghies coming at me. Uh, so I made sure that everybody was there, they were welcoming uh, me, all the friends, and then we passed through all the boats. I was quite shocked because there's a lot of boats in uh, Martinique in Santa, and maybe 200, maybe 300. And then we went to the very front where the club met us. Uh, and on the way we passed through the boats and it was unbelievable. Omar told all the boats that I was coming <laughs> along <laughs> and everybody was kind of out and clapping. Ah, it was such an amazing welcome. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. It was so good. I had such such, such a warm welcome in Martini. <laughs> it was amazing. 
Okay, now that means you are the first Turkish woman across the Atlantic and now you're going to make the next step Pacific next year? Or? Uh, next year, but it's not going to be alone. So what mm -hmm. I'm thinking about now, so sailing alone is, I think, the one of the most precious things in life. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you reach to a point and we all seek for friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, we all seek for entertainment and life is more beautiful when I'm together with Omar. So that was a dream that I wanted to realize. I would do it again and again and again, do it in the Pacific or sail from one place to the other alone. But right now what I want to enjoy is these new, new places that we have been to and making a uh, meeting with new people and seeing new cultures, which is more enjoyable than done with Omar. So right now the plan is continue uh, to the Pacific next year together. Uh, but once we are back in Turkey, then I can just start uh, sailing solo again. So how many how many women do you think crossed the Atlantic alone this season or the previous season? I don't know at least one. <laughs> I know a few men did it or do it every year, but I never met a, a woman who did it. So. So why do you think woman 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 is not there? Because I see that. Even not the Atlantic crossing, have a look around and then you can see many men sailing solo. But you don't see many women sailing solo. Yeah. So why is that, do you think? Small boys, they tell them you have to be strong, adventurous, uh, a real man. And I think women grew up different like that. Yeah, I think there is a lot of inequality. So yeah. uh, my case attracts attention. Because we are not many and we are not many because there are a lot of inequality on our regular lives. So it's even harder for a woman uh, to afford a boat. Mm -hmm. And I mean insisting and saying that it's just my boat. I will live on a boat and sail alone with a boat. Because even we are not paid equally with men in every country, even the most developed countries of the Europe. So that's why actually we don't see many women. So this is actually what I'm doing is a way of beating the inequality in a sense, because it's not only sailing alone, but also uh, being able to afford the sailing alone and then being able to show this to the other woman, just opening a door. And there are many inequalities on the sailing world as well, not only the woman and also people with different ethnic origins. You don't see them. So the sailing world is the white European or white American, elderly, middle-aged man thing. Uh, so, so this is a kind of beating the inequality in a way. Well, it's the light of mine. Guess I'll let it shine. Oh, it's the light of mine. Might as well let it shine. It's the light of mine. Might as well let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh. 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 <laughs> Yaklaş! Yaklaş! Hadi yaklaştırın, kadehleri getirin!